Hello and welcome to episode 43 of the SAP on Azure video podcast. Today is May 28th and together with Robert and Goran, we're here to talk about anything related to SAP and Microsoft. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello. Hi. So two weeks ago, we had Roman on the show who talked about Power BI, Azure Synapse, and, and he showed us how we can connect to this famous S-Flight data model and visualize the content in Synapse Analytics. Obviously, S-Flight is only a very small data set. And today, actually, we have um, Bartos and Marius here on the show who will take this topic forward and um, who will talk about um, how you can combine this with um, a, a Power App, how you can um, use data extraction, additional accelerators and stuff like that. But before we go there, before um, they introduce themselves and then show us their, their scenarios, let's quickly go over some of the news from this week. And, and obviously it was, it was um, built, so there's a lot of content. And um, I mean, I, I, I condensed a few links, I extracted a few links, but actually on, on GitHub, on our um, GitHub repository, um, I will post much, much more links uh, because there was a lot of, of content. Um, I, I don't know if you saw a lot of, uh, uh sessions i actually only saw the the very quick um keynote from satya which i think was like 20 minutes or something like that and then i saw one session by charles lamana um for for the whole power platform and then obviously the developer keynote by scott hanselman and and, and friends so unfortunately that was all that i could see so far but luckily ev everything is is available still for uh, to to watch and obviously then we, we have this um, book of news and uh, lots of um, related links I would say um, in there. <clears throat> and build is more concentrated on developers. So yes. Say, yeah. So more than for the IT guys, but still, even in the SAP context, like we will see it today, you know there are so many development or integration topics which are definitely going into that direction. Absolutely, and, and and that is actually. I mean, we don't need to go over the book of news because I th I think I have extracted um, uh, uh -huh. some of the content there. But exactly what you said, Goran, and um, this this whole it was really developer um, focused. I mean, this is this is what build is all about. But what I found really interesting was that there was a huge focus on the low code no code platform. Um, uh -huh. So obviously there was news uh -huh. about Visual Studio 2022 uh -huh. and stuff like that and um, new .NET releases, new versions and, and that, that's all very important obviously. But actually um, and maybe this was just my um, my bubble, but I, I, I saw I thought there was really a lot of news about um, about the power platform. So and, and that's actually what I want to start with. Um, one one interesting thing was, so you know, Power Platform is all about um, low code, no code, empowering the the business user, the citizen user to do something. Um, we had talked about this new Power FX um, functionality that allows you to write Excel like um, formulas. And what the the beautiful thing there is, I, I don't know how it is with you, but whenever I I um, write a more complex Excel formula or, or also in Power. I usually Google and, and look for what was the syntax again and stuff like that. And now um, what, what we did with the Power Platform is we added this GPT-3, this um, open AI um, tool set basically or model to um, help with the automation of creating these, um, these snippets. So basically, instead of remembering the exact formula, what you can do is now here, show me customers. Uh, I don't know, show me customers from the US, blah, blah, blah. So you type in your query what you want to show in natural language and then Power Automate or this um, GPT-3 engine um, creates the required formula out of this. And oh. I think, I mean, <clears throat> what better place to introduce or infuse here AI um, than in these low code tools? Because that, I, th I think, I mean, the, the whole beauty of the Power Platform is that um, you are, and not a developer, you are really a business user and an end user. And obviously you can create like with PowerPoint um, your, your user interface. But now if it comes to the more complex scenarios where you want to filter something, that's where you would need to have this filter, bracket, brackets, customer, comma, whatever. And now you just write the question 
and then um, Power Automate creates this this formula for you. So I thought that was a really interesting um, announcement. Um, so going on from there, another really important topic, and I think that's also where where the Power Platform itself, this um, low code topic, is frowned upon by by some developers. Um, is well, yeah, they're doing their own stuff and that's it. But um, I think Microsoft is really taking this this very very serious, and we're putting a, um, a focus on this fusion of developments, basically, which is all about well, um, yes, there is this low code developer, the 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 the, the end user, but they are also the professional developer. They're they're the power developer. They are they're um, certain domain experts that that come with SAP knowledge, for example. And it's all about bringing these different personas together and and really helping them to everyone should focus on on the things that that he or she can do basically and this this fusion of teams um is something that um yeah microsoft is really taking a closer focus on so so not only supporting this from a tooling story but then also here um, um providing um yeah learning materials and 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 ebooks that really um help you understand to oh. Yeah, here to bring your pro devs and business together to build apps faster. So I think that's it. It's Power Platform is not something that is standalone, but it's really something that that helps you to bring the different um, teams together. So so that's I think something that's also extremely relevant for for our case, obviously where we want to bring Power Platform closer together um, to the to the SAP world. So that was something that I also um, extremely liked. Um, then yeah, if if you have not yet started with um, Power Apps, there's now a Power Apps Developer Plan available, so you can really use this for free, and um, it's you can also use the the premium connectors there. So it's yeah, it's it's really easy to get started. So if you have not done this, now is the time. Now you should definitely sign up to this Developer Plan for Power Apps and 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 start playing with it. One last Power um, Platform block here. Um, so here, Julie Strauss. Um, Talks about all the things that I just um, um, quickly mentioned in these in these um, uh, previous um, uh, links. Um, she 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 brings all of this together again and and talks about here the fusion of development. She talks about um, the AI integration, but then she in, in in this blog post she she also mentions yeah the the integration here with um, CI/CD um, pipelines. Um, obviously, if you are um, a pro dev, you you know um, that CI/CD really helps you. In this uh, in this agile big um, uh, platform development, so so I think there's now support there via CLIs. Um, then yeah, obviously the integration with Visual Studio Code and Visual Studio. So it's it's really nice to see where the Power Platform is evolving. So, so again, still addressing the business user, but making sure that um, the business user can beautifully work together um, with um, pro dev pro developers. Now, with this, if we switch sides and if we really look at the pro development, so if you if you're looking at um, using app services, Azure Functions, and API management, I mean, Logic App is, I would also almost say, um, um, a very simplified way or an easy way um, to do development or workflows. But um, what Gabe mentions here is that um, now these services. Um, can actually really run anywhere. So together with Azure Arc, you're now able to run these applications um, not only on Azure, but um, really on premises or on AWS oh. or on Google. So it's really a beautiful um, cross-platform um, option that, that allows you to um, yeah, really embrace this hybrid um, idea of development. Actually, I, I don't have the link here right now, but I'll, I'll put it also in the show notes. Um, there was one interesting comment again from Tobias Hoffmann that, um, well, with SAP, you have the cloud, apl apl cloud application programming model, um, CUP, um, which could also be a perfect fit in here so that um, the um, CUP could also use um, these Azure Arc um, Kubernetes um, functionalities to make sure that CUP runs not only on the business technology platform, but that you could also deploy and run it um, on premise, on AWS, on on Azure, and on Google, and so on. So that was a very interesting thinking, and let's see uh, how how this evolves. Good. Then um, 
yeah, maybe in, in the interest of, of time, um, I mean, just running over this, obviously also with Logic App. So John has has um, published a, a blog where he talks about um, the new functionalities in, in Logic Apps, how um, this can now also um, run like what, what we previously also talked about, not also not only in, in Azure, but, but really also in other environments and um, how there's um, yeah new tooling support available that you don't need to do this in the Azure portal, but there's really this integration in, in Visual Studio and stuff like that. So um, there's also a lot of news um, around the whole Logic Apps um, topic. With this, let's quickly switch to um, teams and the whole um, collaboration area. Um, I think that's also really interesting because you know Christian Klein and, and Satya Nadella had announced this Teams integration of SAP, where we where we are focusing on um, SAP Sales Cloud, Success Factors, S for HANA, and trying to integrate this in 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 Teams. And now Teams is really opening up and and providing you more and more possibilities to integrate and collaborate. So um, there, there are new functionalities that, that you can create your new um, backgrounds and and uh, these uh, now nah, where, where, where you just show the, the, the faces in different um, areas. So so Teams is really yeah opening up with, with lots of new enhancement points. And, and this blog, blog post basically guides you through some of the steps where, where you can um, enhance your Teams experience now and uh, yeah, enrich it, for example, also obviously um, with SAP. Now, in order to do this, um, the Teams team actually has released um, a Teams toolkit. So this toolkit is available for Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. And basically what it allows you is to, to simplify um, the whole development. So where in the past you needed to do a lot of um, copy and pasting to um, get the uh, corresponding application ID, register your application and so on. Um, a lot of these things are now um, part of this um, of this uh, toolkit. So uh, yeah, you can just use it again in, in Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code and then quickly create um, applications. There's also a GitHub repository somewhere um, that uh, where, where a lot of temp templates and, and examples um, are available. So yeah, it, it should be fairly easy to, to get started to build um, these new enhancements um, for, for Teams. Um, yeah, I'll skip the graph. So again, for, for graph, there's there's a lot of new announcements there, what you can do there. Take a look at this um, offline. Um, maybe one other quick thing is the um, developer keynote from Scott Hanselman and friends. I, I thought it was a really exciting, a really engaging um, keynote. So um, yeah, it's available on YouTube, so you can easily watch it. And I think it was it was really entertaining, and it's definitely um, worth um, to check out. So all of this is built, but obviously in general, SAP on Azure is is also progressing independent of build. And um, Goran, thanks for the for the reminder. And um, Cameron has published yet another um, uh, regular update on SAP on Azure, where I think. Yeah, we we have again a, a nice condensed overview of what's happening in the SAP. I mean, there, there are a lot of a lot of topics there. Um, some of them we we mentioned as well, like Sentinel. He's mentioning, but I would say uh, um, Azure Snapshot Backup for Oracle. That's very interesting because we have SAP on Azure with Oracle customer, for example, including ASM. ASM is a special Oracle. Um, 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 storage management system, you know, which customer can use, which simplifies the operation. So this is also already also there. Very interesting because customers do ask for the Azure backup part. They want everything from the Azure as a cloud service. And then basically he would talk about many, maybe not, not to mention other stuff, but about the block sizes, which are typical and issues which customer wrongly configure and then have a performance issue and why he would, this would be important. Some some news on on a cluster setup on on a, a Linux. Oh, always useful if they would use an Azure fencing. Um, yeah, other stuff like job job logs to put interestingly not on a file share but on a database. You you know and pointing to the DMO migration parts. Um, so Cameron is basically doing a lot of. Um, um, based on a customer experience that he has, this is for example Windows cluster, stretch cluster, how to handle, though that 
people would use, let's say, for the SQL Server as an example of a stretch cluster, you need to um, move the host name with the IP address to another and then time to live is always important. So those kind of all many very practical details. OK, we mentioned also those in the past, also new <clears throat> um, um, uh, um, virtual, machines. Uh, virtual machines. These kind of is interesting because Cascade Lake enables you to run MV1 on, as a Gen 2, which means enables you to later upsize to the MV2, which is also Gen 2. Uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, if you can't change from MV1, which is Gen 1, to MV2, which is Gen 2, it's not possible. So that's always too good to have in, in mind. Um, yeah, on HANA large instances, yeah, and some issues that were found on Gen 2, for example, on Linux, uh, Windows part. So let's, it, it's a lot of stuff. I would say just take, take a look. Um, yeah. Yeah, but typically very, very useful from Cameron here. It comes always as a summary and his experience with on, on a customer side. So okay. I believe we can, we can uh, wrap it up finally and uh, switch switch to uh, our guest, to Bartosz and Marius. Um, maybe just feel free to Bartosz and uh, all kid on the blog, but still I would say uh, you can introduce yourself. Definitely one more who, for the guys who see you for the first time and then we can switch to Marius as a, as a first, first kid on the blog. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for, for inviting me again. It's really great pleasure to to show the things that we work on and uh, that I think inspire our customers. So I'm Bartosz Jarkowski. I'm a cloud solution architect. I help customers with migrating and innovating SAP landscapes on Azure. I really think Azure is the greatest place for hosting a SAP system, not only because we have the, the, the best infrastructure, also because of the surrounding story. I, I mentioned about this previously when we described the uh, invoice processing topic. Mm -hmm. This time we'll focus more on data analytics and how to do, how to make the use of your SAP data on Azure. Today with me is Marius Panga. Marius, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thanks, Bartosz. I'm really happy to be the, the new kid on the block. Uh, I'm Marius Panga. I'm a cloud uh, architect. My, my position is very similar uh, to Bartosz's, but my technological focus is around uh, data and analytics on the Azure cloud. And I work closely with Bartosz in a lot of instances where we have this joint workloads where there is SAP, but there's also uh, Azure data and hopefully some of our best practices and experiences we can we can show on this call. Cool. cool. Perfect. So let me let me start. I, I watched the episode with Roman and it was really great episode because he presented in a very structured way how you can get your data out of SAP, no matter whether it's transactional system or BW system, and then process it and present. In this episode, we'll focus on this first aspect of the on the data extraction because we we believe that this is a very often a trouble for customers. Customers have a very large SAP systems containing millions of rows in a single table, and well, when you think about extracting a million rows every day, it's quite difficult, quite challenging, and you need to remember about a couple of tricks that, that you can implement with, with Azure Data Factory, and this is where we'll focus today. But before we do it, uh, I would like to show very quickly uh, a small analytic dashboard that I've created in, in Power BI. This is fully running on SAP data, which are extracted from a SAP system. So it, it has three parts. The first part is purely operational reporting, whether we analyze the, the sales order data. So in SAP system, I have thousands of sales order, which I extract from, from SAP system using Azure Data Factory. Then I transform it using Synapse and I load to, uh, to Power BI. Here on this first part, we can see uh, basic things like what's the sales by, by month, what are the top five customers, what's the sales by country. Uh, you, we can see uh, latest orders. What what I really like uh, in, in this part is that we can actually create hyperlinks inside Power BI that will open this sales order in a CP system. 
or we can like here create a hyperlink uh, that will open a special uh, Fiori application to solve uh, problems with, with sales order. So this is all possible from Power BI. The second tab that is available here talks uh, focus more on customer experience. So what customer likes about our products and what dislike. This data is not really available in a CP system. It usually comes from a surrounding systems. In this case, I'm getting this data from Twitter because Twitter is the, I think, the biggest source of feedback for, for everyone. So using Azure Cognitive Services, you can extract extra key phrases from the tweets, you can measure the sentiment, and this way you can you can analyze what customer likes and dislike. Even more, you can extract the customer sentiment from the tweet and correlate this with sales order mm -hmm. value. And you can see that if customer have trust in your products, like you, like your product, the, the sales value is quite high. But as it drops, your sales value also drops. So you can really get interesting insights out of it, out of blending SAP data with data coming from other sources. And I think this is the one of the greatest feature of Azure because it really makes it easy to get data from SAP to get data from your manufacturing system, to get data from social media, blend it all together and discover things that were hidden from you. Mm -hmm. I think this is something new. I think it will gain more traction in future, how eliminating data silos can actually influence your business. And finally, the, the, the third part of, uh, of the dashboard is what I called intelligent insights. So in this case, we are using some of uh, uh, some of Azure technologies to, to get some additional information. So, for example, uh, I tried to analyze the, the sales forecast using Azure Machine Learning. And I'm not, I, and I didn't have to write a special algorithm to do it. I, I just used the automated ML. And I think the results are quite good because when we look at the uh, forecast for February, and the actual sales is, is quite close. In March, the results are even better. April, May, of course, it's all about tuning, how you can tune the data, how much data do you have. But this forecast can be actually important input for your demand planning. Mm -hmm. I, I think, Bartosz, you're always telling like you're not a developer, right? So, I mean, it goes into then this direction of load code or let's say no code here meaning it's it's easy for anybody non-developers to enable such a functionality in an easy way without really knowledge of programming exactly this is this is very important because i know pretty much nothing about programming i i, I wrote a couple of programs when i was 15 <laughs> but it, it, i'm far away from from writing a complex uh, machine learning algorithm and i still was able to do it this is really Basically, great yeah Machine learning, it's uh, its a whole philosophy, but we have just the building blocks which, yeah. which we just plug in and use it, right? Yes, For exactly. the purpose, which is perfect. <laughs> yes, and, and this this map over here, uh, imagine we could install small, small IoT devices in every track that does outbound delivery for us. Mm -hmm. And based on this, we can Firstly, visualize on, on a map where the track is, but we can also measure the distance from the destination using Bing, AP, Bing Maps API, and we can measure what's the plant arrival. And if the plant arrival is later than what we scheduled in our SAP system, we can automatically send an email to the customer saying, dear customer, we are very sorry, but there is traffic ahead of us. We are 200 miles away from you and will be delayed three hours. Mm -hmm. This brings this this experience to to completely completely different level. Yeah, you're right. And then it's really not only this visualization that you show here, but really being able to take actions out of this. Yes. Exactly. Well, yeah, a beautiful example. Mm -hmm. Yes, be, uh, be, the data that you have can be actionable, uh, and this is the true power where you can apply automation, like with uh, invoice processing. You you have the data you you don't want to do repetitive tasks. 
you yeah. avoid them. You, you make your data actionable and they speak for you. Really so, nice. So, so this, this is the dashboard and this is what you can create using your SAP data without any problem in, in Power BI. And I think Roman two weeks ago really excellently uh, presented this. Now we would like to focus on, on the data extraction, why this is important. So when, when we think about data extraction, it's always uh, using data in your, in your SAP tables. And there is plenty of SAP tables in, in ERP system. I think Roman showed there was more than 260,000 tables. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that was amazing. So, so when, when he asked this question, I thought like mm, around 100,000. I, I usually use the, the example of 100,000 tables, but it, it's much more, it's much more. So really, identifying the tables that you need to, to for your use case, uh, setting it up to, to have automatic delta loading, uh, incremental loading, because you don't want to extract very large amounts of data every single time, it's important. And well, you can do it in, in ADF, but usually it takes time and requires some special knowledge. We thought we can create an accelerator to simplify the process. So I asked Marius if we could do it together. And yes, we have the, the first version of the accelerator ready. And Marius, over to you if you'd like to describe. Yes, thank you very much for that, Bartos. I will take over the screen briefly and I'll start with the, with the boring part, if you will, which is uh, the Azure stuff and what's going on on the ETL side on the extraction. And then we can move on to the to the UI that we've added on top. So as you said, uh, I think in one of your past episodes, uh, Roman did a great job at showing how you can use Data Factory to pull data out of SAP and then do processing and do reporting on it. And he showed this copy data tool that already exists in Data Factory with which you can actually do a lot of stuff without writing a lot of code. So you can go see a list of all the SAP tables that you have in your environment and uh, the huge number of them. And then you can select which tables you want to you wanna process and then you just load them onto, say, a, a data lake. Now that's good, but it doesn't give you a huge amount of control. So it, there might be situations where you want to extract 10, 20, 100 tables. And if you just use this wizard, it, uh, Data Factory will just try to load all those tables in parallel which might put a lot of strain on your SAP system. In some instances, you might have some large tables like um, AC, Docker, BZAC, whatever, that are really, really large, and you might want to load that huge table first and then load a few smaller tables in parallel, then uh, load another few medium-sized tables in parallel, and so on and so forth. So have like a, a sequential batch approach of loading data. Other situations, some of these this SAP tables are very, very wide. You have lots and lots of columns. Now, if you just get all the data from them, that's going to be more memory pressure on the SAP system. It's going to take longer to transfer across. It's going to eat up more space on the disk, and it will be harder to even consume from a tool like Power BI. So potentially having a way to easily just specify the columns you want to select is quite important, and that's something you can't easily do here. And also, lastly, uh, just things like, OK, you want to start loading, maybe just you want to apply some filters. You don't want to load all the data from a table. And then once you load that data, you want to potentially start loading incrementally. Now, all this is possible, but you can't do it with this wizard. So what you'd have to do is potentially start building these pipelines from scratch. And while that's got quite common and not that difficult, we're still just ingesting the data. So it might not make sense to spend time developing when you're just copying the data as is from SAP to the, to the data platform. You're not yet doing anything fancy or complex. So that's where uh, me and Bartos are trying to just accelerate this process a bit and just use a bit of metadata driven process in order to, to make these things easier. So just to show you the, the high level overview from Data Factory, uh, keep in mind, all this will be backed by uh, by a metadata database, which I'll cover in a little bit. That just has metadata about the tables we want to load and how we want to load them. So within Data Factory, we have two pipelines: one master pipeline that's just orchestrating the whole thing, and then one child pipeline that is just doing the actual copying. 
In the master pipeline, we have a few steps. First step is just we're initializing the load. So we're logging something in the underlying metadata database. That's quite good because while Data Factory gives you a lot of monitoring, sometimes it's nice to have everything centralized in one place, in one database, especially at the beginning when you're stress testing your system, you're checking how long different configurations take. It's nice to have it all in one place. Then you can build potentially a Power BI report on top of that database, makes it all quite easy. So we're just initializing this load. Then we're just doing a lookup against the, the metadata database to see, okay, do we have any tables we want to load? If yes, do we want to load everything in one go or do we want to split in batches? Maybe start with one big table followed by two medium tables followed by I don't know a lot of small tables. So in that way, we don't send too much stuff to the SAP system in one go and potentially overwhelming it. And then lastly, once we know how many batches we want, we're just going to do a for each statement where we're going to say, OK, for each batch, you go and do your stuff. Now, this for each is set as sequential, so that means each batch will process, finish, and then the next one will start. Going into the, the second, the child pipeline, this is where we, we, we call this for every single batch. And what happens is, OK, for this batch, again, we're making a query to the underlying metadata database and ask as which tables are part of this, this batch, which tables do we want to load in parallel from SAP as part of this step in the load process. We do that, we get a list of tables, and then again, we have a for each step, but this one's we actually want to load in parallel in order to speed things up. So this is not uh, set as sequential. And then in here, again, very, very simple. We just log the start of the copy procedure on a table, and then we also log when the, the copy has finished, the data was ingested, whether that finished uh, with success or with failure. And this allows us to easily see how long it took, how many rows were transferred and all that. Now, the, the important bit here is the, the copy data, and this is the bit that's actually transferring the data across. And you'll see we have a source or a sync, sync aka destination. The source is SAP table, so that's the connector we're using. And then we pass on a lot of parameters. These parameters are coming from that metadata uh, database that we have behind the scenes that's just driving the whole process. So we, we need to tell it, okay, which table do we want to load from SAP? And then quite importantly, if, and this is optional, which columns do we want to load from this table? But again, this can make a big difference. Some tables are very wide, and in most situations for, for, for analysis, you don't need all of them. Then, so next one. The, the, yes. If I may ask, the, the metadata information, which are automatically collected, helps you to select also or to choose which columns do you want to use? Yes, absolutely. And like we are trying, so I'll show you how that metadata is structured behind the scenes. But then Bartosz is going to show you how we're trying to accelerate that bit as well. So it's not just that this is metadata driven, but we're giving you an, an accelerator to populate that metadata quickly because yeah. a lot of this stuff is known quantities. A lot of the SAP modules are known. We know which tables go into those modules. We know what columns the various tables have. So why would someone have mm -hmm. to remember or, or write them right. down? So, but again, if you don't want to go into this data, a lot of these, these options are uh, optional, so you can just skip them. Then uh, this is the step where you say, OK, do I want to do a full extract or an incremental extract? So it's quite common that the first time you run a pipeline, you might want to do a full extract because you want to load a lot of historical data, maybe at the where clause, maybe not. But then once you do that, you want to schedule this to run, say, daily and just load yesterday's data. And again, this this reduces the, the burden on the SAP system. Everything takes less. You, you duplicate less or no data. Another one is the partitioning, which again, we found very important because by default, when you pull from a table, uh, Data Factory will just send one query and try to get everything back. That might be too much memory pressure on SAP and it might be suboptimal. So for large tables, again, for large tables, this makes sense. You might want to partition these queries and rather than just send one query to pull in all the data, you might want to partition it by, I don't know, by month or by day or by year, depending on how, how big your table is and whatever makes sense. So this is where we specify the partitioning and then what column in the data set we want to partition and then just some other settings around the partition like upper and lower bound. Lastly, 
how many partitions. And this is one that we found is quite good to, to test around in order to find the best number. You don't want to go to with too many partitions because then there's overhead in just creating all these sessions, getting the data back, maybe creating too many files on the Azure side. But again, if you go with too few partitions, then the queries might be returning too much data. And then we're back to the whole too much memory pressure, not the, the best way of pulling data. And then in terms of the sync, the destination, in this case, we are using Parquet. I think Roman mentioned or uh, uh, talked a bit about the Parquet. It, it tends to be the, the standard for, for big data platforms, nice columnar compression, metadata rich, really easy to use downstream. And also we specify a path. Okay, how do we want to store it? It's very easy for a data lake to turn into a data swamp. You'll end up loading data from multiple modules, potentially multiple systems, on different days. So whatever the, the folder structure you decide to have on your leg to avoid this governance and maintenance nightmare, this is where you, you could implement it. So that that's from a data factory perspective, that's it. It's not a big deal. And I'm just going to show you in terms of monitoring, you just have the two jobs. You have the master job that gets kicked off. This can be an on-demand kicked off or you can just schedule it. And then you have the, the child. Uh, job that will have various steps. So you can see the, the starting of the logs. And then the, in this case, I'm just loading free tables. So that's what my metadata is saying. I can see here on the right which tables I'm actually loading, AC Docker, VBRK, VBRP. And then on, on all of this, these steps, I can go into a bit more detail via the uh, data factory interface to see well, this is not the best example. Let me get one that's potentially a bit larger. You can see how much data was written in terms of rows, files, uh, kilobytes, how long it took, what was the throughput, a lot of these details. So, and you can get quite granular. You can see exactly what configurations were sent to SAP via the SAP connector, how those were interpreted, if you're sending any where clauses, how those were passed in, so on and so forth. In terms of the data that gets loaded, and I did mention it's quite important to try to avoid making your lake a swamp. So this is a pretty standard uh, folder structure here. So uh, I have a data container, SAP being the, the source system I'm pulling from. Then I have a subfolder that's called ingest, because this is exactly how I'm pulling the data in. In some instances, I might want to do some enrichment or joining or transformation and then potentially put that in a different folder that could be called curated or sandbox or whatever my processes. In here, uh, I specify the data type. Maybe I don't want to just use Parquet, maybe something else. The actual entities. And then as I drill into the entities, I have a year, month, day uh, folder structure just so that I can potentially just query subsets or recreate them and, and all that. But because it's all in the AC Docker folder, when I query this either using Power BI or other processes, I can just point the query engine or the processing engine at the folder level, and then it automatically just finds all the, the various subfiles and joins them together to show me the data as if it was coming from a table. Okay. Just a little bit on the actual metadata that's driving all this. So in this case, I'm using an Azure SQL database. I'm using serverless to, to save some cost, so it only wakes up when I use it and then it goes back to sleep, optimizing cost. But this can be anything. The, the concept of it being metadata driven means you just need to have the metadata in some format. So you could have it in a different database, in SharePoint, in JSON files, whatever your preference is, if you feel like a database might be overkill. It doesn't matter. And then We'll see it's not a lot of tables here. The, the one that I guess it's most important and is driving the whole thing is a table called tables. So not very creative here. Hopefully you, you can see I have the table name. So this is the mm -hmm. table I'm actually pulling from SAP. And you can imagine here, this could be a much larger list. I have the partitioning option. Do I want to partition when I'm doing these extracts or not? If the table is no, small, then probably you would go with none. But in this case, we're, we're simulating a fairly large table. So in this case, I choose to partition on the calendar date. Then what is this calendar date column I want to use for partitioning in the data source? And this is the data. Then how many partitions do I want to use? Upper and lower bound. These are just specific to the partitioning. I have a flag whether I want to load the table, yes or no. So for development scenarios, I might test various tables and switch others off. This can be quite useful. Then I mentioned this load batch. So right now everything has load batch equals one. So all these three tables would be loaded in parallel if or when I run the pipeline. But I could say one here, two, two here, and then 
AC Doka goes into the first batch and then VBRK, VBRP go in parallel in the second batch. So again, you can control, you can play around, find the best configuration for your load. An optional wear clause in addition to, to any incremental or partitioning. The type of load, do you want to do a full load or incremental? And if you choose to go incremental, what's the column on which you want to do incremental? So if, if we're only going to load data that was added or modified yesterday, then what's the date column within the data that allows us to identify those rows? And in some instances, we've identified that it's not just one column, it might be two. You might have a creation date and an update date that are separate. So that's why we have two incremental columns. This is all customizable. So if you want to have three, four, five, depending on the use case, it's quite easily extendable. In addition to these tables, we have a uh, table columns here as well, which just specifies for the various tables, which are the columns you want to load. Again, this is optional, but if you have that information, we can just add it here. As the process runs and as we execute it, I mentioned everything gets logged. So let me just order this by um, start time or execution start. You can see these are all my runs, so I can see the various tables that I'm loading. Where are they going? When did they start? When did they end? How many rows did I load? And then also how long did they take in terms of, of seconds? So this can be quite good, and you can imagine how this could easily be exposed via a Power BI report to see any outliers, anything that hasn't completed successfully. So yeah, you can you can slice and dice as you want. And then just before I hand it over to to Bartosz again, I just wanted to highlight this this uh, SAP tables template. So this is how we're trying to make everything easier, so that you don't have to write all the tables that you need. You don't have to write all the columns. There is just like there's a reference table oh, that we nice. can provide that already has the tables, has yeah. the modules, has a lot of business terms that are already in here. Maybe even some recommended configurations like for this table, we recommend you partition. For this, we don't. This is probably going to be incremental. This probably won't. So those kind of things, they, they don't have to be set in stone, but you can just import them like that and then you can go in and start changing. And just as a next step, this is not already implemented, but since we are collecting all this metadata, it's very easy to imagine how a next iteration, which we're thinking of is, once you load all this data, it's still using the SAP terminology, table names, column names, how we could just create like a serverless view on top of these files that we're loading that actually has the business terms automatically as part of this accelerator. And then as soon as you ingest, you can just connect, say, Power BI to a serverless endpoint that already sees the tables and the columns potentially with the business terminology rather than the SAP technical terminology. That's not so yet that, in. That that's would plus. simplify basically the building of the Power BI or other Power Apps guys who are maybe not so familiar with the SAP table exactly. naming, right? Yeah. Yes. I nice. mean, you still have it in the source. You still have them with the technical name, so you still have all the lineage, but then you're adding this semantic layer, if you wish, or this business definition layer that the business can easily understand, and then they can slice and dice directly where you've ingested the data without any further downstream processing, if, if that's not yet required. Nice. Cool. And I'm going to hand it back to, to Bartosz to some 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 cool uh, UI stuff now. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think the, the one thing it's important to mention that this whole accelerator thing is fully available to everyone. Uh, it's published on GitHub and we'll include the link in the description. Uh, so yeah, feel free to, to get it, try it, uh, deploy it, extract some data, leave some feedback, uh, even create your own innovations uh, to, to to this accelerator because we think this is a really great starting position for you to to start extracting data but we don't think this is your ultimate goal i i think this solution should grow with you and if you need additional functionality you can easily add it add it enhance it and why not sharing it with others again so yes marius Describe nicely the, the metadata table, a metadata database, and it's quite easy to, to access it and, and add tables that you need to, to extract, especially that the fields name are, are self-explanatory, but we wanted to take it to, to the next step. So we used Power Apps to create a user interface 
that you can deploy on top of ADF and the uh, metadata database. So using this user interface, you, you can quickly see how many, for example, pipeline runs were there and what, what's the success rate or failure rate, uh, how many tables were included in the last replication. You can, of course, go and display every single paper pipeline run and you get information whether it was successful or not. Let's scroll to the one of the first one that uh, extractions that I run. So in here, uh, start day, beginning of this year, we can go and see which tables were included, how many rows were there. Mm -hmm. And then if we go back and and see the, the next execution, we see ah, yeah. that the, there was the... incremental load. So in the first instance, there was a couple of thousand rows extracted. Now we have just, just 14 uh, rows for VBAP table. The, the whole configuration is done in this tables tab where we can define a table and define the, the configuration. So for example, for AC Docker, or maybe AC Docker is a bad example. Uh, let's focus on the VBAP and VBAC. Uh, yeah, basically we, we can feel the same settings as Marius described. So whether we want to load the table, what should be the load type? In, in this case, uh, it's set to full. Uh, probably for, for the uh, VBAC, VBAP incremental would be better. So we can easily go here and, and change this to, to incremental. And already this incremental columns created on, changed on, are automatically populated. In which batch we would like to do, what's the lower bound uh, for the extraction, uh, what's the partitioning. So yeah, we can save it and then run. But the next thing is this template view. So instead of really defining these tables manually, so, so going here to the add table, providing the name, I don't know, uh, Mara table and, and filling all the details, we can just click here on the add table from template, choose SAP area you are interested in, let's say master data, and you can just select a table. Oh, so I would like to have information about plant data for ma material. You can just select this, click import, and this table, MARC, will be already included. Cool. With the default setting. So in this case, partitioning is, is disabled and lo the load type is full. But if so, we go and select, I don't know, uh, yeah, SKA1, this one already have incremental column, uh, last change timestamp field. So, so we can also import this. And during the next run, this table will be included in, in the replication. Of course, from this place, we can also enable and disable these, these extracts. So, so whenever we change this, the table will or not be included in the extraction process. That was a quick question. Um, so, so you're retrieving this information here from the SQL database, right? So yes. you have to and in ADF, when the, um, the batch runs or when, when the pipelines are executed, from ADF, you're querying also the SQL server to retrieve like what are the tables that I should fetch now? Yes, Correct. exactly. Cool. So so Very basically nice. this power up is a user interface for the met metadata uh, yeah. database. Yeah. Uh, if I correctly understand, it's basically you're simplifying the life for the business user who are creating the power apps, for example, to decide in an easy way what will be extracted, which tables, how it will be done without need to access the backend stuff, maybe in an Azure portal, so to say, uh, as an example, right? So yes, because when we talk to customers, very often they they want they have a use case and they want to to extract the data. They don't want to to run long project to analyze or oh, how can we extract data from SAP system. If they are on Azure, they already have access to Azure Data Factory, which is easy to use. Now with the accelerator, they click one button. And the whole solution is deployed to uh, to their Azure tenant. They can deploy this power up on top of it, and basically the only thing that's missing is pointing ADF to your SAP system. Assuming mm -hmm. they are run in the same Azure tenant, you can deploy the solution in, in the same VNet. You you just start working. The, the whole solution can be deployed within I don't know a day. 
probably maybe maybe two days uh, if you do it for the, for the first time and you can focus on what's important to you on actually using right. this data instead of spending time and and thinking oh how can i implement incremental loading for for sap data okay cool oh, that's really nice yeah. yeah and i like this template idea uh, so so basically what what you have already done but i guess what both of you have done you, you went through some of the tables i mean i guess not all 260000 mm -hmm. tables but, um, no, no. So for now, we we selected, I think, that the most commonly used, uh, the basic tables. Uh, of of course, we'll include more. It's just the matter of of really going sure. through the tables, uh, understanding what's what's important for customers. And of course, as more and more customers uses this, we yes. get experience with this, and and we know what's important for for others. I think we included the the most important tables to to start with. So when mm -hmm. you think about uh, even the dashboard I've created. So you are using the, the sales data. So so we just go here to sales and distribution. And yeah, you 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 know which you don't even have to know the technical name from, from a CT table because yeah. you, you get the, the table description. description yeah. So so you can just select and, and enable the, the extraction. Then okay, so I have logistics data. I would probably like to get some uh, information about master data so what i'm actually selling so master data mara table material dis descriptions and probably i would like also information about business partners because I, I would like to know who i'm doing business with so yes again i can just go and say okay so i would like to to have yeah general information about business partners and maybe their addresses cool that's it click import and if everything is is included and will be replicated during the next run. Ah, that's really great. And nice. yeah, you definitely need to share the, the, the GitHub link. Um, yes, yes, we will. Uh, we are still working on the documentation. Uh, there is limited information right now, but, but we are building this. So hopefully over the next days, uh, we'll add more information, how it works, how to deploy the whole solution. Uh, yes. and. and Feel free to collaborate with us. Uh, GitHub gives a lot of possibilities to to work with uh, with us on this. Uh, yeah, you are welcome. Perfect. Oh, I love this. Simplify already simple stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's really amazing. I think this is really great, and I I like the idea of having it on GitHub. So potentially, if if I'm using this and I um mm -hmm. want to import a table or, or a replicated table that is not yet there as a template then i could just go in there and and enhance it um, make a pull request on github and show look there there's one more um table template so so hopefully this will really grow over time so i yeah. i think it's it's really beautiful it's really nice it's really nice we are aiming to make it as simple as possible from a deployment perspective so right now with the, the github repo has like a one button deploy to azure you click on it and all the azure components including the metadata database with some sample data already in there so that you can easily understand what goes where is added we pre-populate those uh templates with the data we have and then the only thing you need to do is download and uh start running the power app we I don't know if we can include that in the one-click deployment or not. We need to double check the, the latest releases from build if that's supported. But yes, and I guess the only thing to, to make clear is if you do take it and start using it, this is an accelerator. So you still need to make sure that you're happy with, with uh, the security yeah. posture, with the way it gets deployed, all that. You can't just take it and push it into production. That That's not our aim here. It's just to, to make it a bit easier for you to, to get started. Cool. Nice. Cool. Great work, guys. Great. Really nice. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Well, with this, I think that that's a that's a beautiful continuation of what um, Roman showed, and now you're you're perfecting the the scenario how to actually get the data. And who knows, maybe in half a year we can have you back, both of you back, and and then you show us some some additional amazing things that you have done with the data. That'd so be nice. Perfect. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it was really great to have you here. Barters to have you again. Marius to have you here for the for the first time. Like I said, I would be really happy to have you, uh, both of you back on, on the show at some point. With this, thank you very much and uh, see you soon, hopefully. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.